This lesson is on glucagonomas. So if we were to look at the word glucagonoma, oma refers to a tumor, and glucagon refers to the hormone glucagon. And this is exactly what these are. They're neuroendocrine tumors of glucagon-producing cells, which are alpha cells in the pancreas. So the rare pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Most of these are going to be sporadic, meaning that there's no family history, there's no genetic predilection, they just occur. And having said that though, about 10 to 20% are associated with a familial genetic condition known as multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 or MEN1. This is a autosomal dominant condition that is due to a mutation on chromosome 11. And it's associated with other signs and symptoms, including hyperparathyroidism and also pituitary adenomas. Now, glucagonomas again occur in the pancreas. So if you were looking at this image here, here's the stomach, and here's the first part of the small intestine known as the duodenum, and here's the pancreas. If we were to zoom up on the pancreas, the pancreas is full of islets of Langerhans. These are groupings of cells that contain both alpha cells and beta cells. So again, the alpha cells are what produces glucagon, and beta cells produce insulin. And a glucagonoma is where we have a excessive growth of alpha cells, which are going to produce high levels of glucagon. Now, most of these glucagonomas are going to occur in the tail of the pancreas, this part here, where the pancreas kind of tapers off or becomes more narrow. So 80 to 90% of glucagonomas will occur in the pancreatic tail. Now, not everyone that has a glucagonoma will have signs and symptoms, but if there is high enough levels of glucagon that cause symptoms, that is what we call glucagonoma syndrome. We'll talk about those symptoms later on in this lesson. Now, glucagonomas are very rare. It's estimated that only 0.01 to 0.1 new cases per every 100,000 occur per year. So only one new case per every 1 million people occurs each year. And the age of onset it will occur in the 50s to 70s, but most of the time we're going to see it in the 50s to 60s. So it's going to be something that occurs later on in life. Now let's discuss how glucagon is regulated and what it actually does in the body which will help us better understand some of the signs and symptoms of a glucagonoma. So again, if we look at an islet of Langerhans, again, it's groupings of beta cells and alpha cells. So we've got alpha cells that produce glucagon and we've got beta cells that produce insulin. Now, certain factors will regulate the activity of alpha cells. Some of these include low glucose. So low glucose will lead to an activation of alpha cells to produce glucagon. Another hormone that leads to activation of alpha cells is gastric inhibitory peptide, which will then lead to higher levels of glucagon. And we also see the hormone ghrelin. This is the hungry hormone. This is the hormone that increases when we're hungry. This too will also activate alpha cells to release glucagon. Now there are certain factors that inhibit release of glucagon. These include insulin, somatostatin, and GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1. Now again, as we mentioned before, glucagonomas are going to be an excessive growth of alpha cells. And a lot of times, the alpha cells that are produced, there's so many of them, we're going to get a very high level of glucagon. And it's going to often be released autonomously, meaning that a lot of these inhibitory regulatory mechanisms will not really have major effects on whether or not alpha cells will release glucagon or not. There is a little bit of effects here. So we can see some effects with regards to these, making some symptoms worse at some times and other symptoms better at other times. But a lot of times these alpha cells will produce glucagon autonomously. Now what happens when we have glucagon? What is glucagon's function in the body? If we're to look at the liver, one of the targets of glucagon is the liver. And the liver has glucagon receptors. So glucagon is going to bind to and activate glucagon receptors in the liver. And what that's going to do is that's going to lead to elevation of cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP levels will increase in hepatocytes which will then lead to increases in activation of certain pathways, including glycogenolysis or breakdown of glycogen. So glycogen acts as a store of glucose, and also it leads to activation of gluconeogenesis, so converting non-glucose substrates into glucose. So both of these have the role in increasing glucose. So if you look at this regulation again, we have low glucose being an activator of alpha cells to release glucagon. So glucagon acts to increase blood glucose levels. And it does so again by activating glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And other effects that glucagon has in the body includes lipolysis or breakdown of fat. So both of these are going to be important when we talk about some of the signs and symptoms. Now, the signs and symptoms of a glucagonoma are often going to be remembered by the mnemonic six Ds. 
The first day I want to talk about is dermatitis, and more specifically, it's going to be a skin finding known as necrolytic migratory erythema, or NME. Now, this is what this skin lesion can look like. So it's going to be a skin lesion that occurs spontaneously in different parts of the body. More specifically, it's going to occur in places where there's areas of friction or rubbing. And the skin lesions are going to be well demarcated. If you look in this image here, they're very well demarcated compared to the other surrounding skin. There are going to be erythematous plaques. They can be blisters. They can be blisters that rupture as well. And they can also be something that occurs with burning, pruritus or itching sensation, and they can be painful as well. And they're going to be episodic, so they come and go, and they're going to occur in association with changes in nutritional status. Now, about 70 to 80 percent of individuals who have a glucagonoma are going to have necrolytic migratory erythema, and this will be a specific finding for glucagonomas. And once these resolve, they're going to leave a hyperpigmented area of the skin. So after these skin lesions have resolved, they will be darker than the surrounding skin. And again, we talked about the fact that they occur in areas of friction and rubbing, and a lot of times you're going to see it on the hands and forearms, feet and legs, buttocks, pubic area, groin area, and even the perennial area as well. Another of the Ds is diabetes. So we're going to have high levels of blood glucose or hyperglycemia, and this makes sense. We talked about the fact that glucagon will lead to activation of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis pathways to increase glucose levels in the blood. And because we have so much glucagon, we're going to have a hyperactivation of those pathways. We're going to have too much activation of those pathways. We'll have too high of a level of glucose in the blood. What we can also see is deep vein thrombosis. So that's another of the D. So patients who have glucagonomas are more prone to having thromboses or clots forming. The reason is because the tumor itself releases a protein that is similar to factor 10. So the tumors not only release glucagon, but they can release other components and other proteins that can increase our risk of clotting. And this deep vein thrombosis can lead to a consequent pulmonary embolism. And a lot of patients can have a lot of morbidity and mortality because of these clots. We can also see the fourth D being declining weight. It's going to be a progressive declining weight, and it's going to be unexplained. A lot of times patients can lose more than 10 kilograms of weight. It's unexplained again. And this is again going to be due to glucagon's effects on lipolysis. It's breaking down fat. It's breaking down adipose tissue. Patients also can experience depression. So with along with depression, they can have other psychiatric effects, including issues with concentration. They can have cognitive decline in some cases as well. And some patients can have diarrhea. This could be more related to some patients who have glucagonomas that are associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 because in some of those patients they can also have what we call gastrinomas and gastrinomas are tumors in the pancreas that release high levels of gastrin so that high level of gastrin can cause something called zollinger ellison syndrome that can lead to extremely bad heartburn and also diarrhea so the diarrhea could be associated with the patients who do have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 so that is something that can also occur before we move on, I just want to briefly talk about the fact that these are going to be some effects that occur very rapidly. So all of a sudden, a patient can have diabetes, they can have hyperglycemia, and it can be a hyperglycemia that worsens over time. It becomes very progressive. And along with this worsening of blood glucose levels and blood glucose or glycemic control, we can also have a worsening declining weight. So these particular symptoms can act as potential warning signs for a potential underlying glucagonoma. Some other findings of a glucagonoma include stomatitis, so this is an inflammation of the mouth, glossitis, which is an inflammation of the tongue. We can also see chelitis, which is an inflammation of the corners of the lips, so we get angular chelitis. Patients with glucagonoma can also be more likely to have normocytic anemia, and patients with glucagonoma can even have vulvovaginitis and blanopostitis, which is an inflammation of the penis and foreskin. And patients who have glucagonoma are at a higher risk of dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, we did talk about the fact that there are some psychological effects like depression, but we can also see poor sleep occurring in some patients, migraine headaches, and paresthesias, or numbness and tingling sensations in different parts of the body. And before we move on, it's important to note that even though this could be a solitary tumor or only one tumor, there is a large percentage of patients who can have metastasis by the time they get diagnosed. So if they have a glucagonoma, it's possible that they have metastasis by the time they get diagnosed. At least 50% of cases 
have metastasis when discovered in the most common site is going to be the liver. So we can get a metastasis of glucagon producing cells that end up in other places, including the liver as well. So I want to point that out. It's very important. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose glucagonomas. Oftentimes patients may have symptoms, sometimes they can be vague, or they may be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for months to years. And oftentimes it can be up to three years of patients having symptoms before they get a proper diagnosis. Now, when diagnosing glucagonomas, it's important to do lots of blood work. So fasting blood glucose is going to be important, glucose tolerance tests. So it can look like they have diabetes, but again, we're going to see them have a rapid onset of diabetes with worsening glycemic control. So that can be a possible warning sign to think about. It's also important to check CBC. We talked about the fact that they can have anemia. It's also important to check zinc. It can be more likely to have zinc deficiencies, which may be associated with a worsening of the necrolytic migratory erythema. And other things to look out for in blood work include amino acids, liver transaminases, alkaline phosphatase, and bilirubin. These are important in looking for metastases to the liver. As we mentioned before, at least 50% of cases, maybe even up to 70 to 80% may have metastases to the liver by the time they're diagnosed. And the way to specifically and definitively diagnose glucagonomas is by taking a glucagon blood level in the morning, very important. What they're gonna find is that the glucagon levels are going to be two to three times higher than the upper limit of normal. So this is what's gonna be found on blood work. And another possible thing to check on blood work is chromogranin A. This could also be elevated in glucagonomas as well. We mentioned the fact that about 10 to 20% are going to have multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. So we wanna look out for that especially if they have a family history of other issues, including insulinomas or gastronomas or hyperparathyroidism, etc. Imaging is going to be very important as well. So doing angiography, CT scan, and magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI. And if a patient is having a flare of the necrolytic migratory erythema, skin biopsy is going to be important to do as well. Now, how do clinicians treat glucagonomas? It's important to optimize glycemic control. This can be difficult with a glucagonoma. So a lot of the anti-glycemic medication that can be used doesn't really work well. So a lot of that diabetic medication may not work well, but it's important to optimize glycemic control. And again, it's often refractory to normal treatment. Symptom relief will be very important. So if they have any other symptoms like the necrolytic migratory erythema, they can use certain things like corticosteroids and other treatments. Somatostatin analogs can be helpful. And one of them is octreotide. We talked about the fact that somatostatin acts to inhibit the activation or activity of alpha cells, which produce glucagon. So octreotide can help reduce glucagon levels. This is going to be important for symptom relief, but also can be helpful for prepping the patient for surgery. So if it's a localized disease, there's no metastasis, surgical resection is going to be important. So is a surgical removal of the glucagonoma. If it's metastatic disease, then along with surgery, we'll have to have systemic chemotherapy. And one combination of chemotherapies is the combo of streptozotocin and the anthracycline doxorubicin. So those are some of the ways to treat glucagonomas. Please check out my other endocrinology lessons if you want more information on those topics. Please also consider joining as a member for members-only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you again soon.